All right, so let's start uh, last lecture. We talked about the problem of domain adaptation. What was the problem uh, in the training, during the training, we are given labeled samples from the source domain and we are given unlabeled samples from the target domain. So let's say I have some source samples, they are labeled. These are labeled source samples. But we also have unlabeled samples from the target domain unlabeled target samples. And the goal was to find a hypothesis, a function, train on these uh, data that we have in the training in order to perform well in the labeled target sample. So the goal is to find let's say a function in my hypothesis class that performs well in the target domain, right? And we talked about um, practical methods uh, and assumptions in order to make sure that this goal is achievable. Right, so we had three assumptions, if you remember. One was covariate shift assumption. Uh, that says the conditional distribution of labels given Xs should be uh, the same. Uh, we had the assumption that the joint error on the source and target, if we had labeled target samples in the training should be uh, small. And uh, the third assumption was that it, source, unlabeled source and target, they should have some sort of relationship uh, with each other with respect to the hypothesis class. And uh, for that, we characterize H divergence between source and target. These were the main assumptions. Then we um, you know, saw some uh, upper bounds on the target error based on uh, different components that directly reflects these assumptions. And we talked about practical uh, methods that people they have developed in order to deal with this problem. Mainly the idea is to find an embedding of your source and target access uh, features in a space such that their uh, distance, their distributional distance is small. So they're somehow aligned to each other. And that is measured by a Washenstein, IPMs, MMMD, um, classification errors, so on and so forth. So that's basically, roughly speaking, the topics that we covered in the last uh, two lectures about domain adaptation. All right, so today we are going to uh, talk about a related problem to domain adaptation. It is called domain generalization. Or sometimes it is referred to as out of distribution or OOD generalization. Okay, so what is the setup here? All right, in the training, we are going to have labeled samples, not from one domain label samples potentially from multiple domains. Let's say I have um, E domains. I have, uh, these are my training domains or environments. And I'm going to receive labeled samples from each of these domains or environments. Let's say the distribution for an environment E is represented by um, P um, uh, sub E, and we are receiving uh, 
some number of samples from this particular domain. So, um, I have xi, e, and yi, e for the environment e. And how many samples I have? Let's say I have m e samples. So I receive labeled samples for all of the environments I have. Okay. So what is the goal here? The goal here is that if you train a model on these labeled samples from different domains, you train a single model and you take that model and apply it to a new domain or a new environment, an environment that had not been seen during the training. We want to have a good performance in that new unseen domain or environment. And that's why it is called generalization. So we wanna learn a hypothesis uh, a function, a, a function from our hypothesis class that has a good generalization to unseen domains and environments. So here the goal is to, again, find a function in our hypothesis that performs well in an unseen domain or environment. Let's say my domain is um, a domain E plus one, I have, so let's, you know, for simplicity, let's call this K, I have K domains. So this will be domain K plus one. So I, in the test time, I observe samples from distribution PK plus one, according to uh, this particular distribution, I don't see it in the training. Let's say we observe MK plus one samples. Okay. So I'm going to apply my function, evaluate my function over samples coming from this distribution. I'm going to look at the error that I observe using that hypothesis uh, uh, function that we, we use in the training. And this is going to be my uh, error in the new environment. Right? So I refer to this as error in the um, new environment, environment K plus one using hypothesis H. So we want to pick a hypothesis H that minimize a function H that minimizes this risk in the uh, unseen environment. So that's the goal of domain generalization. Right, so I see a couple of questions. Um, are there any constraints between these environments about how they should be related to? Excellent question. Uh, you can see like the problem is not well defined at this point, right? Because if my new environment, my new domain is completely different than the domains we have seen during the training, then why should I be able to learn a function in the training domains to be able to have a good performance in the new on-scene environment. Uh, yes, these environments and domains are related to each other. Uh, in a hand wavy fashion, we assume that there are some underlying quote-unquote invariant features that my function can use in order to uh, perform the same task in Across different, across different environments, right? So I'll give you some examples, so hopefully that will uh, clarify uh, 
clarified. But that's like a kind of a hand wavy uh, assumption in terms of how these environments are related to each other at this point. All right, there's another question. Can domain be viewed as feature of a given input? If so, can the generalizability principles um, that we reviewed before be applied here? Good question. Uh, so you may, uh, basically by domains, you can think about it in different resolutions. So the extreme resolution is that for each sample, think about it as it is own domain. But you know that's not going to be very um, you know useful uh, because uh, at the end of the day we want to find some features that are invariant across uh, different you know different types of samples. Uh, so that's how we you know in a kind of a hand wavy fashion domains are defined. These are like let's say you have uh, samples are coming from like sketches or cartoons. And these are samples that roughly speaking, they have the same features. Uh, and the features can be used in the classification task in order to um, you know, perform that task on you know, either test or training. Now, if you look at some other types of samples coming from, let's say, natural images, uh, then you have still uh, you know, the same invariant features embedded in the new domain, but you have a lot of other invariant features. You have like the backgrounds are different. Uh, and if you rely on the invariant features, yeah, you will be able to you know, have a good generalization. But if you rely on some spurious uh, features specific for that particular domain, uh, it's not going to be possible. Uh, so thinking about each sample as a domain, therefore you may not be able to distinguish between at these invariant and um, domain invariant and non-invariant features. In that case, a label can be a domain as well. Yeah, so you can think about it. As I mentioned, there are different resolutions uh, to uh, can be used for defining a domain. So I'll give you some examples later on. Hopefully, that will clarify some of these questions. Okay, so let me. Um, uh, give some examples uh, to basically I think clarify some of these um, some of these uh, definitions for the domains. Uh, so the example data sets that people they often use in order to understand domain generalization problem. There are many interesting data sets. Uh, one of them is called domain net. So it has six domains. What are these domains? For example, you have some images coming from paintings. You have some images coming from, let's say, photos. You have some sketches, so on and so forth. Right? So all of them, let's say you have an airplane either it's a cartoon version, it's a painting version of that airplane, or it's a sketch version of the airplane, or you're actually taking a photo of that airplane. All of them are airplanes. So for humans, if I show you a sketch or if I show you a you know, photo of an airplane, you will just immediately say it's an airplane. We want to have the same property for the model. And that's what we mean by domain generalization. We are saying that, okay, so if you, uh, show maybe the first two or the first five domains to your model in the training. You train your model based on that and then test it in a completely unseen domain, like sketches. Um, we believe humans can you know, achieve, uh, accomplish this task. Uh, and we want to have the same property for uh, the models that we train. Okay. Um, another data set uh, that is pretty standard for this problem is called PAX. I believe it has four domains. If I remember, I don't have it in my notes. And they are 
again images coming from art cartoon again photo sketch okay uh, there are some simpler data sets as well Uh, for example, you can think about different uh, variations on MNIST data set. So there's one data set that is called rotated MNIST. Let's say one domain is zero degree rotation, zero degree rotation, so you have all ones. In another domain, you have um, all digits rotated by 15 degrees, 30 degrees. Again, the idea is that if you if you're really learning a model that can classify one from two, it shouldn't matter if you're rotating it with 15 degrees. Right? So that will give you um, basically a model that is invariant to rotation. Another data set uh, which is very interesting is called colored MNIST. Again, the idea here is that so you have uh, labels for each images and then you color it. Color is now your spurious uh, feature that you don't want to use. You can have different correlations uh, between the label and the color. For example, you can, uh, let's say here, the correlation, correlation between label and color is 90%. It means that 90% of ones you color it with, you know, red. The rest, the remaining 10%, we color it, let's say, with uh, with um, blue. Um, and in the test or in other domain, you may have some other uh, sorts of uh, correlations. You may have uh, maybe uh, more pink uh, for the for the ones than uh, for the twos. Uh, here, you don't want to fully rely on the colors. You want to really learn how one or two looks like in order to uh, do the uh, classification test. Okay, so uh, uh, before I take uh, quest, uh, questions, um, so these are, if you, th if you see, these are like art, cartoons, photos, sketches. These are like pretty distinct uh, domains in a way. Uh, you can also think about uh, domains coming from natural variations in your data. Uh, so maybe you are training on some samples, uh, clean samples uh, for a classification task. And then you go and apply it in practice, there are, you know, different sorts of natural variations. Maybe the, the camera is angled, you know, uh, differently. There are some blurring here, you know, you know, here and there going on. There may be some, um, you know, other sorts of, you know, noise, you know, corruptions in the, in the image. Uh, and you, you also may want to um, have a good generalization to, uh, you know, those you know, quote unquote, you know, noisy samples with natural variations. And, you know, sometimes, you know, when people, they talk about domain generalization, um, they look at, you know, either both of these, you know, cases or uh, one of them. So that's something to keep in mind. So I'll talk about some of these uh, results about natural variations towards the end of today's lecture. All right, so there is a question. Um, uh, the question says, uh, say art sketch have short, and so make if you are, uh, if you can unmute yourself, uh, can you read your question? Hi, uh, professor. Uh, what I was asking is that uh, in uh, sketch and art, we have uh, different kinds of representation a lot of times that uh, that don't exist in real life. Like we'll make some smiley face for, for example which is not a good representation of real life images. So like, aren't these like too far apart, say uh, art versus photograph? 
Excellent, excellent question. Um, so, you know, the question is, um, in fact, like if you look at, you know, uh, cartoons or sketches or real photos, they may be actually too far from each other in order to learn a single model to be able to do uh, the, the classification task successfully in, you know, in each of these domains. Um, and it is certainly possible. There are definitely features in cartoons or sketches that, you know, very specific for that domain. So the hope is to see if we can have some sort of invariant feature, maybe like the whole shape of an airplane uh, that can be used. Maybe it has wings and stuff um, uh, in order to do the classification. Uh, but that's a, certainly a really, you know, a good point to think about whether or not if domain generalization is possible uh, and under which conditions it, it is possible. So uh, there are some empirical results uh, about that. So I'm going to talk about it. But um, as far as I know, there aren't a lot of um, uh, theoretical uh, results on, in that space. And that's a really important space. Okay, um, so here is the schedule for today. So first I'm going to talk about methods. So what, what, are, what are the main methods for domain generalization? Uh, but I'm gonna spoil it and say, basically none of these methods are good in practice. So we should keep in mind, so I'm going to talk about the limitations, but I think it is important to first understand what are the methods out there and maybe think about some potential extensions and improvements on them in order to deal with this problem. Okay. So our baseline method is do nothing, right? Just use ERM and hope that the model that is learned on minimizing the joint error on the training samples will generalize well to an unforeseen domain. So here, basically, we are just solving an optimization. I, I pick a model that minimizes the average error. So remember, I have k domains. So I'm going to look at average error coming from each domain for that particular function. And I'll pick a function that minimizes this joint error. So that's basically do nothing. And you know, let's see if it, this function will generalize well uh, in practice or not. Uh, there's a question, do we retrain in this method or just inference? Um, retrain, um, I, you know, I don't quite understand your question, but let me explain it again. So you have K domains in your training. You just run an ERM. Basically you put like all of your data in one bag, train a model using ERM, and then pick that model and test it in, in the unseen domain. And that's it. So I'm not retraining the model basically because in, in, when I'm testing the model in an unseen domain, then I'm in the test time. So I cannot use any information to come back and maybe pick a better, uh, better model in my ERM. Uh, did that answer your question? Yes. Okay. Good. Thank you. Sure. So th this is my training. And in the test, I'll just basically um, find the error of this function on the new domain and evaluate how we are doing. Right? So this one, this is a new domain. Like it's the baseline or what I like to call it, do nothing, right? You're doing something, obviously, you are you know, training an ERM, but you're not doing anything specifically for this uh, particular domain generalization problem. Uh, so other approaches are 
uh, two something approaches. Right? So what are uh, so do nothing approach? What are the do something approaches? So one idea is basically um, uh, use adversarial training uh, in order to find a representation that is invariant across training domains. So I don't know what I have, what I'm going to have in the test time, uh, but I know maybe I can find an embedding of my Xs coming from my training domains such that the phi of x applied to each of these domains, my training domains, they are going to be um, you know, very similar to each other and that similarity can be measured in different senses. In a way, it is using methods developed for domain adaptation to this particular problem. Here we have labels, so maybe I can just minimize conditional um, distances uh, between my phi of x's coming from different domains condition on a particular label. So I have a little bit extra information compared to domain adaptation, but roughly speaking, the idea is uh, the same. All right, so the idea is to use domain adversarial neural networks. A N N. There are so many variations of uh, this method. I think we covered uh, some of the basic domain adversarial neural network methods uh, last time for domain adaptation problem. Again, the idea is to find a feature map and then apply your classifier on top of it. So I'm going to look at functions uh, that is composed of a feature extractor. And here I have a classifier. Okay. Um, so what is the idea? The idea is that now I have my feature extractor phi. And then I have my classifier here. Now, if I look at this part, I want uh, when I apply my feature extractor on different samples coming from different domains to have roughly speaking the same, the same distributions. So one way is to maybe train a domain classifier. So here is the domain classifier. And just to be clear, this is the label classifier. Right? It's basically the very similar idea to what we covered in the domain adaptation um, lecture. So what I'm gonna get in terms of the loss function, so I have basically my classification loss comes from this part. So what do I have? I have k input domains. So I'm going to look at the average classification coming from each of these domains. All right, so what is my function? My function is composition of w and phi. And then I'm going to basically penalize the classification loss. I'm just gonna write domain classification, but you guys know what, I'm, what I mean here. So this domain classifier is going to act like an adversary for me. So it is going to try to classify the um, uh, the um, samples coming from uh, different domains. And if it is successful, 
then you know we are uh, in trouble it means that the features that we find uh, after the uh, applying this phi function they still carry some information uh, about the um, some information about the each domain as well okay so i see there's a question shouldn't the second term be negative yeah it depends uh, if you're doing min or max uh, if i remember i did the negative version last time so let's go with the negative okay so what are the optimization objectives that we have here so here i want to train phi and w to minimize this loss function right if my c is fixed here c is fixed so i'm basically picking feature extractor and the classifier in order to minimize uh, this loss function uh, what about the optimization on c so the classifier uh, wants to uh, basically try to uh, classify this correctly so it tries to minimize the classification error but there is a negative here that's why i say there is a negative um, it depends how you you know do this so basically because of that negative we want to maximize over uh, let's say c this classification loss if my phi and w here are fixed W actually doesn't, you know, come here because that's the uh, label classification network. Okay, so roughly speaking, this is the same idea that we had for the, you know, um, domain adaptation problem. But here we have multiple uh, domains in our training, so we can use the same idea in order to deal with this problem. But now you can uh, say. Um, um, okay, so there's a question. It says that in the domain adaptation, the domain classifier classifies between source and target domains. In this case, is it only between multiple source domains? Yes, because here I don't have any information about my uh, test domain, right? So the, the idea is that if I have diverse training domains and if I could successfully train a feature extractor that is invariant to uh, each of these training domains you know quote unquote hopefully it will have a good generalization to an unseen domain okay so now you can say all right so what about other methods that we covered for domain adaptation we had like mmmd laws we had the washington or gan laws can it be used in this problem? And the short answer is yes. So you can um, use MMMD or Warshenstein, or sometimes we will refer to as GAN laws for this problem. Again, the idea is very similar to what we covered in the domain adaptation. So you have an X you have a feature extractor, you have your label classifier, and here you're going to train a discriminator. Discriminator for, for example, if you're using the Washington loss in order to penalize uh, the, an approximation of a Washington distance between transformations of samples coming from different domains. Let me be a little bit explicit. So what is the loss function here? The first term is the same as before. So you have K domains. So you look at X, Y is coming from each domain. And what else? You wanna penalize, you wanna minimize let's say a distance between your distributions uh, after you apply this transformation file. 
right? So let's say you are doing Washington distance between what, right? So now you have options and there are many variations of this idea. Uh, here compared to the domain adaptation, we have also labels, right? So you can maybe even just focus on each label and then penalize the Washington distance for X's for that particular labels coming from different domains. So you, let's say you have PX for a particular label coming from, let's say, domain J1, and you look at PX for the same domain, for J2, and then you sum it up over all uh, J1s, J2s, and Y. There are uh, all, like more efficient ways of doing this as well. Here you are looking at pairwise um, uh, distances between domains. You can define like a, maybe a centroids for these distributions. Then instead of, if you have K domains, you have, instead of having K squared terms, you will have like roughly speaking K terms. But all of the ideas are basically very similar to what I'm describing here. And for the implementation, Obviously, we cannot uh, compute the exact Wachenstein distance in general uh, efficiently because that this is the maximization. So instead of like writing in the primal form, if you remember the GAN lecture, so we write a dual form of this Wachenstein, and that gives me a maximization over a discriminator, which is one Lipschitz. Expectation of let's say samples coming from the first domain minus samples coming from the second domain. Obviously these X's are distributed according to that particular domain given that particular label uh, that you are considering here. And as I mentioned a couple of times uh, in GAN lecture, in domain adaptation lecture, and I want to emphasize it here. So this condition is not going to be easy to uh, characterize, right? So in general, we use neural networks in order to characterize D. So in a way, we solve an approximation of this when D is a neural network. Maybe with some sort of um, penalty for it is gradients in order to ensure that it is Lipschitz is, uh, is bounded, uh, but it, it may not contain all Lipschitz functions. So you basically, uh, at the end of the day, solve this optimization problem. Again, you have a minimization over, minimization over phi and w for your loss function, and then you have a maximization over d for uh, the loss function that we have, and then you uh, alternate. Uh, here, Washington is just one uh, such distance. Uh, people, they have used MMMD distance here as well, instead of Washington, and then you get like MMMD uh, domain generalization uh, approaches. All right, so let me pause and see if there are any questions. Any questions? Okay, if not, let me um, talk about another method, which is a little bit different than the methods that we have covered for uh, domain adaptation or domain generalization. Uh, so it is based on meta-learning. So if you have time, we'll have one full lecture on meta-learning, but uh, let me just talk about meta-learning for domain generalization. So it is based on a work by Lee et al. In, from, in 2017. So what is the idea? The idea is actually really simple. 
So if you have a lot of training domains, you have, let's say, K domains, uh, try to create a test environment for yourself using your training domains. Right, so you have uh, K domains, maybe separate, you know, two of them, and don't use it in your uh, first part of your training, and use K minus two in the training phase, and see if actually your model does well in the, you know, remaining two uh, training domains. Right, so the idea is to separate K training domains to two parts. So you have, let's say, K minus, let's say, uh, K one of them, it's called meta train domains. And K one of them you use for your meta test domains okay so i i want to emphasize that meta test domain we have it we have it available during the training so it is not the test domain that we basically say it is unseen but in a way we are creating we are simulating a new environment for us to evaluate the models and see how we are doing um, during the training. It is similar to a validation set, but not precisely the same. So I'll explain you know, what I mean by uh, making sure that the model that is trained on these K minus one meta train domains, we want that model also to perform well in K, the, the, the remaining uh, K1 uh, meta test domains that we have during the training, right? So in validation set, you don't actually, you know, update your models or you, uh, based on that. So it's 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 going to be a little bit different. So I think if I explain it, uh, it will uh, be very clear what we mean by that. Okay. So in the meta train domain, we have the following loss function. Right, so we are going to just use an ERM to minimize the average error. Really simple. So it's a meta train. Let's say theta is my model parameters. I have K minus K1 domains. And I'm going to look at the average loss for each of these domains, or let's say that particular function that I'm using. Now the idea is that we'll basically take one gradient step in order to update the model based on this loss function. If you take one gradient step, to update the model, what are you gonna get? So your new theta, let's say theta prime, would be your old theta minus your learning rate times the gradient of this loss, meta train, evaluated at previous theta. Right? So you just take one step of gradient in order to update your uh, parameters. So these are my updated model parameters. Now I'm going to evaluate my updated model in meta test domains. So the next step is to evaluate the updated model in the meta test domain. So what is the loss for meta test? The loss is the ERM evaluated at theta prime because I'm evaluating it off after the update. So I have K1 
meta test. Let's say j starts from k minus k1 plus 1 to the um, last domain I have. And then I look at my was evaluated at theta prime. So that's really, um, really the key here. Okay, so I want to pick a model theta. What's my goal? I want to pick a model theta. When I do ERM on my meta training domains, I hope after let's say one step of update, I also have a small loss in my meta test. So why we should just you know, leave it to the fate? So we can actually try to pick a theta that not only provides us a small meta train loss, but at the same time, a small meta test loss evaluated at theta prime. Right? That's the key idea here. So the overall, objective is going to be this objective. So you are picking a theta, minimizing your meta train, but we are we were hoping that after I take one step of gradient and then evaluate it in the meta test, it performs well, but I'm not gonna keep it to leave it to the face. So I'm going to penalize my meta test evaluated at theta prime, right after one step of, one step of the. So if I replace this theta prime with the formula that I have, what is that formula? It is theta minus eta, which is the learning rate, the gradient of my meta train evaluated at theta. So this whole objective, again, it's a function of theta. So I can just update it uh, using gradient descent. So what is different here in gradient descent update compared to a regular ERM that we just take uh, the gradient of the loss function and update the model based on that? So what happens if you take the gradient? So this guy is your new loss function, right? So this whole thing, I call it meta, loss function of theta. Uh, yeah, so if you look at the gradient of this uh, guy, yeah, you get the gradient in the meta train, but then you need to get the gradient of like the meta test. And yeah, so that will be the, you know, gradient, you know, that you push, but then that should be multiplied by the gradient of your gradient, which is the Hessian. So then you will get a Hessian times gradient product to uh, update the model, right? So in other words, to update this, uh, we need to compute um, the gradient of this loss function that we have, but it depends on the Hessian or second derivative. Right? And Hessian can be very, very big and expensive. This is a Hessian with respect to theta. If you have, uh, say, uh, one million parameters, this Hessian matrix will be a, a million by million matrix. It's really hard, it, big, it's really, yeah, even expensive to store in uh, the computer itself. So, uh, but luckily we need, we don't need just to look into this Hessian. So at the end of the day, uh, what we need, we need a Hessian vector product. Because there's a gradient uh, outside of, uh, outside that we'll need to look into the multiplication of that. And that can be uh, solved quite efficiently. So I'm going to talk a little bit more uh, about this in you know, some of the future lectures. So I'm uh, here just saying that 
patient vector product can be can be solved quite efficiently. So you don't actually need to compute explicitly um, the um, exact uh, Hessian itself. It is not similar to the kernel trick, no. Uh, so the Hessian vector product, you can use it as a, you can basically write it as, a, as an optimization problem and then solve that optimization problem using gradient descent. Okay, uh, so let me see how much time I have. I have uh, about um, 15, 20 minutes. So one other method that I wanna talk before I talk about some of the empirical uh, results in this problem is called invariant risk minimization. Minimization or IRM introduced uh, recently by Archowski and co-authors. So what is the idea of IRM? It says, if you find a feature uh, extractor such that the optimal classifier on features is the same um, uh, for uh, every domain, the features that you're going to find, they are going to be invariant. So that's basically the uh, idea of IRM. So it says find a feature extractor by such that optimal classifier is basically the same for different domains. Is the same for every domain. All right, let's say I have this feature extractor, fine. And they may be looking to a linear classifier. So let's start with that. Uh, let's define just to simplify the notation, the average risk that we'll observe in each domain. Let's say my risk in each domain for a given phi and w is just like the average error that I have. Loss applied to w composed with phi. So the objective the objective of ERM is going to be the following. So we are going to find a feature extractor phi and a classifier w hat to minimize the average error across different domains that we have subject to this classifier w hat that we find is optimal in each of these domains. So for each domain that we have, this w hat is in fact the minimizer of the risk if I have the, that feature Phi the same, and I'm just um, is a minimizer over the feature. So basically, it says if you find this feature extractor phi, that the classifier that you are going to find in the second part is optimal for each of these domains for that particular uh, uh, feature extractor. Then again, hopefully it will, with a hand wavy argument, the uh, feature extractor is going to um, compute invariant features uh, for each of these uh, domains. Okay, so first let me talk about the optimization and then talk about limitations 
and that's why I put like this hand baby um, uh, symbol here to see if in fact it holds or not. So first of all, this, this is a top optimization, right? So it's a bi-level optimization. It's a very difficult non-convex optimization, very difficult. To solve because your constraint is actually depending on another optimization. Right? So that's why it's called the bi level optimization problem. So in that paper, they provided a, they proposed a Lagrangian relaxation for uh, this optimization. Okay, so if W hat is optimal classifier in each of the domains, it better satisfy the first order optimality condition, which is the gradient of my model with respect to W hat should be uh, relatively small. Or in fact, in the optimal case, it should be zero. So instead, what they are proposing is to find the feature extractor and W hat First of all, to minimize the, uh, the, some of the risks. That's the first term that we have. Plus this W hat here, plus lambda times the norm of the gradient of the risk. With respect to W, right? So that's what we, you know, want to um, penalize because that's the, you know, roughly speaking, first order optimality condition. And then you can, um, you know, solve this approximate uh, version, um, uh, solve this, up, uh, solve this uh, approximate version more efficiently. Okay, so what is the, what was the argument here? So the argument is that if I could solve this optimization problem, such a function that we find will use only in variant features. Why they argued because non-invariant features will have different conditional distribution with respect to the label. Different conditional, conditional distribution with the label, right? Um, so if in that case, one uh, fixed uh, classifier won't be optimal for all of these uh, environments. Right? But it's a kind of a hand wavy argument and uh, you can see uh, why it may not be the case in practice. Right? So you, you, you may be able to come up with an optimal classifier, W, that is optimal in all of the domains, but phi actually has some uh, domain dependent features as well. Um, so in fact, this may not resolve the issue that was um, designed originally to deal with. In fact, that is uh, the argument in a very recent paper by Rosenfeld. I would say recent, I think it is in uh, on archive in, in the current month. Uh, this is not a valid argument, right? So th that's the whole point of this paper. Not a valid argument in general. So you can even think about the linear case and nonlinear case. And in both, um, both uh, cases, you can show uh, that uh, under very simple conditions, IRM fails to recover uh, optimal invariant predictors. So IRM is to 
recover invariant predictors. But even intuitively, you can see why, you know, just requirement of W to be optimal in all of the domains is not sufficient in order to truly learn uh, domain invariant features. Okay, uh, so that's all I have for the methods. Um, and uh, in the next uh, couple of minutes, I'll talk about some of the uh, recent empirical studies in terms of domain for the domain generalization problem. But let me pause and see if there are any questions. Okay, if no questions, uh, let's move on. So we have like variety of methods, like meta learning method, you know, minimizing Rosenstein distance, MMMD distance, adversarial distance, uh, IRM. Uh, the question is, which method works the best in practice, right? That's the ultimate test for uh, these methods. So there are some uh, nice empirical uh, studies. Uh, I posted two of uh, those papers uh, on our course um, web page. One is by these people. Both of them are very recent papers. I think both of them in uh, the last couple of months. All right, so let's start with the first one. Uh, okay, so they basically provide a benchmark to evaluate different methods that we talked. And they have also some nice observations, empirical observations. So I think one observation that is important, I, I want to highlight, you know, uh, sometimes in the theory, when we are just thinking about the, the, the theoretical aspects of these problems, we ignore uh, some of these aspects is the model selection. So model selection is critical in domain generalization problem. Right? So when you are, um, in, in a regular ERM, how you select your model. So you have a validation set, you, you know, monitor uh, the error and see, you know, which uh, model uh, performs the best. So you can do that. That's called training domain validation set. That's one approach. So another approach here, because you have multiple domains, uh, in meta learning, you saw that you know we separate them and then, but we integrate them in order to update the theta model parameters simultaneously. But you can actually leave uh, one of the domains uh, as your somehow validation, and then pick uh, your model based on that. So that's called leave one domain out validation set. So, but interestingly, some of the reported results in some of the papers, so I refer to, I refer you guys to this paper to for the details. They use uh, something called an oracle selection. So, in the oracle selection, you assume that you have some samples from your unseen domain, and you are picking your best model based on based on those samples in your validation set. Uh, and obviously, you can see it violates the key assumption in domain generalization, where we have, um, uh, where we have, um, uh, you know, where we don't have access to uh, any samples from the unseen domain. Sometimes it is good just to, you know, see what would happen in in this case, but it is not a practical assumption. And if results are based on uh, this 
criteria, I don't think it is a valid result for a practical domain generalization method. So one uh, other observation, so that's the first observation. Another uh, observation is about the importance of data augmentation. Data augmentation is really important in domain generalization problem. Right. So what are the example, example data augmentations? You can have uh, maybe random uh, crops of your, uh, of random sizes. You can have random horizontal flips of your samples. You can have random color jitters in your training. So they have observed it is really important in order to uh, improve the um, results in the um, domain generalization problem. So the second paper, they also uh, have the same observation about the importance of the data augmentation. In fact, they uh, come up with a new data augmentation um, called, uh, if I, um, um, uh, based on uh, image to image neural translation. So they have image to image neural translation. And the idea is that, okay, you train these, you know, image to image translators, and then you disrupt the neural network itself. Maybe like, you know, remove a node, remove an edge, and then that will add a little bit of a noise to your data and then use that as a new data augmentation uh, method. All right, so what is the key, uh, the last key observation, uh, empirical observation, is that doing nothing is not terrible. In fact, ERM, at least in these experiments, outperforms other domain generalization methods, right? So ERM is the one, you know, the do nothing uh, method for the domain generalization. Uh, and um, uh, if you are careful in terms of your, you know, model selection, if they are, um, the hyperparameters are selected in a, in a more uh, coherent fashion. If you are doing, you know, data augmentation, ERM is actually, you know, better in terms of performance compared to uh, other uh, domain generalization uh, uh, domain generalization methods out there. Uh, and the other observation is that like larger models actually help in terms of uh, domain generalization. So sometimes, you know, some methods are, you know, tested on smaller models um, compared to uh, other methods. So uh, some differences in the performance may directly come from the choice of the model architecture. So uh, it is better to, you know, evaluate and compare these models um, in the, um, uh, in the, uh, for the domain generalization when, you know, the, the model architectures, you know, and most of the hyperparameters are uh, set in a more coherent fashion. Uh, so this paper, they have uh, uh, their code and data available uh, in called domain bed. I think that's a good resource for this problem to take a look. Right, so, um, I think that's all I have for the domain generalization problem. I'll pause here and see if there are any questions.